Uh, good afternoon. Uh, man, these lights are bright. <laughs> uh, I'd like to start off and just uh, thank um, the organizers who put this put this uh, event together. Um, Burks Ricks Communications, Greg Burton, the Desert Sun. Um, I think I, I wasn't here through the whole conference. I just got here, but I did hear a, a couple people acknowledge and, and wanted to thank the Desert Sun and. That doesn't come too often. You guys get a lot of criticism for things you put out in the press, but I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, ever since we filed our, our lawsuits and concerns with the water usage, um, you picked that up and, and really not taking sides in the issue, you guys have uh, really shown the issue that we have and the problems we have. And, and uh, unfortunately, they, s they seem to be getting a little bigger and bigger. And, uh, but we're here today as a result of, of leadership from the paper and, and all the people here today. Um, this wouldn't be successful if, if there wasn't the, the participants here to, to help make this a good event. Um, real, real briefly, because I know that uh, we're running, running a little behind time, and I'm very honored to get a, a former Secretary of Interior up here to, to speak. But I'm, I'm chairman uh, for Agua Caliente. Uh, I've been on council for 10 years. Uh, you know, he, he mentioned and that I've worked every position and that's, that is uh, somewhat true. And, and I, I think those experiences helped me to be who I am today and, and, and you know, the, the type of person I am. Uh, cleaning bathrooms, I mean, there was no job that was, that was I was too big for, I, I would do it. And uh, it just gave me a deeper appreciation for the employees that we do have. Uh, we have over 2,000 employees and they're some of the hardest working uh, people in this valley and, and the tribe owes the deepest appreciation uh, for the work they do for us. And I know that firsthand. Um, I've been on council for 10 years. Um, a, a lot's happened during that time. Uh, Secretary, uh, Salazar came and visited us when Chairman Milanovic was the chairman. And, and that was one of, you know, toward the ending years of his life, but that was one of his biggest honors that you came and visited and spent time with, with him over at our uh, government office off of Dinah Shore. And, and that, that meant a lot to him. It, it meant a lot to, to my tribe, and it means a lot to Indian country to have a, peop have a person in your capacity um, to take the time to, to reach out and speak to tribes um, when you come visit. Uh, it means a lot and it, uh, in my brief history as, as chairman that didn't happen too often and, and uh, now Secretary Jewell has come down and she's also visited but uh, I'd like to credit that towards uh, what you've done and kind of led that. Um, thank you. Our tribe has been here for more than 4,000 years uh, just a few blocks from here, our people lived in dirt floors, uh, cookie, cor cookie cutter type homes within not my lifetime, but you know, some of our older people in the audience, uh, within your lifetime, you know, our members of my tribe have lived on dirt floors and, and that, that, those humble beginnings is, is ingrained in the decisions we make, meaning we don't make decisions that benefit not only ourselves, but we look outwardly. How it'll affect the community we live in, how it'll affect uh, the entire Coachella Valley, not just tomorrow, but 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, our tribe's been here for so long, and our tribe will probably be here for the unforeseen future. We're not going anywhere. Businesses will come and go, families will move and leave, um, things will change. But the, the one constant, and we would like the, <laughs> The two constants would be our tribe, obviously, and then water. And that's why we're all here today, is, it, is to talk about that. Uh, I, I mentioned um, the reason, I mentioned the lawsuits that we filed and, and hearing some of the, the people speak, uh, talking to some of the people in the audience, uh, reading some of the literature. I mean, these are all reasons why we filed our lawsuit. Unfortunately, uh, public opinion may have been or uh, other people may have suggested that it was a money grab, uh, that the tribe's just looking for financial gain. 
I can assure you that that wasn't the reason why. Um, we've, we've had these concerns long before today. Uh, we fought our lawsuits before Governor Brown declared it a state of emergency, before the drought had become what it is today. We had these concerns before. Not that there were fortune tellers, <laughs> we know what's gonna happen, but that it's inbred in our culture to think of the future and the decisions we make today, how it's gonna affect us. We know the water tables were declining. Um, we had a serious concerns with that and I think when we first filed our lawsuits, the water agencies said that there was no cause for concern. Uh, they've since backpedaled and I, and I think that's great. Um, I think that they're, they're doing a, a better job. Um, I think that we can all do a better job going forward. Um, and to, to uh, just to just briefly speak, one of the proudest things that I'm proud of my tribe, and this isn't necessarily just me, but this is previous councils before me. Uh, for the 10 years that we've had gaming and we've been financially uh, pr blessed, I guess, uh, my tribe has donated more than $18 million to this Coachella Valley, whether that's through charitable work, police, fire, school districts. Uh, we've been a giving tribe, and it's not, and I don't say that to stand up here for you to think that I'm bragging, but it, it's just to show why we do what we do and that we always think beyond ourselves. And... And I, I'm, I'm proud of what we've done. Um, I think that we're very blessed to be in a position where we can to give as much as we do. And, and it, it's a big part of, I, I think, my chairmanship and previous chairmen's tribal leaders' legacy. So at this time, I'd like to uh, briefly speak about our keynote speaker. He has a lot of accolades. I mean, he's, this is impressive. Uh, Mr. Salazar is a partner in the global law firm at Wilmer Hell. He served as the 50th Secretary of Department of Interior for more than four years and was responsible for managing the national natural and cultural resources. During his service, he oversaw energy development in the oceans and public lands and he was responsible for the federal relationship with American Indians. Prior to his service as secretary, Mr. Salazar served as Colorado's 35th United States Senator and was key in creating the framework for the 2005 Energy Policy Act, the 2006 Gulf of Mexico Security Act, and the 2007 Energy Independence and Security Act. He also served as the Colorado's Attorney General, as well as served in the Governor's Cabinet is executive director of the Department of Natural Resources and chief legal counsel to the governor. Mr. Salazar earned his law degree at the University of Michigan Law School. Now it is my honor to introduce you to the honorable Ken Salazar. I know it's late in the day and it's been a long conference for you on a very important topic for all of California and really for all of the nation. And I want to say thank you to a few people. But before that, I want to say particularly thank you, uh, Chairman Gruby, for your leadership uh, on behalf of the Agua Caliente tribe. For me, it was an honor to serve as Secretary of Interior for lots of different reasons. But one of the great items on the President's agenda in mind was establishing a new relationship between the United States and Indian country. And so it was in that capacity that we worked on so many issues from the settlement of major water rights cases to the settlement of Cobell to the Tribal Nations Conferences and so many other things. And it's important for us as we gather today in this time of huge crisis in California on water and as we look at opportunities in renewable energy also to look back at our history that we have been a nation that uh, has not always got it right. Uh, but we're trying to move forward to a, a better place and one of those places where I think very significant, significant progress has been made is in the relationship between the United States of America and Indian country. And so when I see a band like Agua Caliente doing such great things here in the community, 
being part of the citizenship of this community in terms of the charitable contributions that they make in helping resolve these kinds of issues. I am very, very proud of what they are doing. So please join me in giving Jeff Gruby a round of applause for what he and his tribe do. Thank you so much. I want to uh, thank uh, Greg Burton and uh, the Desert Sun for helping put this together. You know, there's a lot of noise and a lot of controversy and just a tremendous amount of conflict when it comes to issues like water and renewable energy, but yet at the end of the day, there's such a great need to bring further understanding to people who are so affected. And so when you have an organization like the Desert Sun stepping up, it's something that just means a lot. I want to thank uh, uh, Jeff uh, Zipperman for also his great work in putting this together and to Brian Ricks, uh, I appreciate uh, your invitation to come and to address uh, this summit. I see friends that I have worked with uh, over time here in the audience, including uh, Nancy Sutley, who now is uh, with the City of Los Angeles, but who is the chairman of the Council of Environmental Quality. And with her, we initiated the America's Great Outdoors Project uh, during our time working in the White House and in my time at, at Interior. Uh, and there are other people who I know here from MWD and from uh, Southern Cal uh, Gas and uh, SEMPRA and so many other organizations that I've gotten to know over my time in public service. Let me say a word about the subject here of the conference, uh, energy and water. And I will spend most of my time talking about water and then I'd be happy to take some questions from you uh, at the end of my presentation. But I look at the energy part of it and hearing the panel of the members of the legislature before, it's important to know how far California has really come on this issue and how far the United States of America has come on this issue. For me, when I was a United States Senate Senator, I had the honor of working then with President Bush and with others on the passage of the only energy legislation of significance that has really passed uh, the United States Congress over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And then as Secretary of Interior, I had the honor of working closely with President Obama and Nancy and others in implementing many of those laws. For the time that I was Secretary, one of the areas that we focused on in our all of the above energy strategy was making sure that we were opening up the door to renewable energy in the country. And we really felt that if we could move forward to demonstrate to the world that we could build projects like those that have been built in the area around Coachella and in Southern California and Nevada and Arizona and places like that, that we could make believers out of the skeptics. There was those people who would say, you can spend all your time trying to chase the sun, but you'll never be able to capture the sun and bring the sun so it's actually powering the homes and industries of America. And yet what has happened is we have done that. And we've done that with the leadership here in California. We've done it with the leadership of others around the United States of America. I still remember early on in one of my meetings with President Obama when he was president-elect and I was U.S. Senator, and we talked about what we do in the area of energy. And we decided that one of the things we do is create an energy team that would really work hard on getting us to energy security for the United States of America. And so some years later, in August of 2012, I was with the president in New Mexico and we were visiting, believe it or not, not a renewable energy facility, but an oil and gas ConocoPhillips drilling site. And as we were coming up to the drilling site, he and I had spent about 60 minutes on a helicopter, and then we were heading on into the limousine and heading towards where he was going to give his speech. I said, I want to just tell you a little bit about how far we have come as the United States of America. When I went to the floor of the United States Senate, Senate with uh, Senator Pete Domenici and Senator Jeff Bingaman, one Republican, one a Democrat, to talk about energy security for the United States of America in 2005, I gave one of the opening speeches for the Energy Policy Act that was signed into law later in that Congress by the President of the United States. And in the opening speech, what I had said is we, as a United States of America, need to find our way towards greater energy security. We need to find a way to become secure, to be energy independent. And I went through a little bit of the history with Richard Nixon coining the term energy independence and Jimmy Carter standing in front of a fireplace saying that we had to embrace energy independence with the moral imperative of war. 
And yet, as I was giving that speech in 2005, I was saying to the rest of the country and to my colleagues in the United States Senate that we were at that time importing 60% of our oil from places that were not our friends, from places outside of our borders, including places like the Middle East countries, Venezuela, and other places who did not have the best interests of America in mind. And I also in that speech said the Energy Information Administration is saying that we will be importing 70% of our oil by the year 2020. So we have to change things to become more energy secure in America. So here I'm writing with the President of the United States to visit a facility. We had come to Nevada earlier on to the President did a, a groundbreaking on one of the solar energy facilities there. And I said to the President, look what's, what has happened. This country has undergone an energy revolution just in the last eight years. Now today in 2012, we are importing a little, at that time, a little over 30% of our oil from foreign countries instead of the 70% that had been predicted by 2020. I said to him, look at what we've done in the area of renewable energy. We are leading the world in terms of solar energy and wind energy and geothermal energy. I said to him, one of our proudest achievements has got to be what we were able to do with the opening up of our public plans to renewable energy. When we came into office in January of 2009, there were zero megawatts of energy that had been permitted on public lands across the United States of America. And yet, as I left office in 2013, we had permitted 11,000 megawatts of commercial scale renewable energy, mostly in solar and wind, across the United States of America. So that was something that I was very proud of. And I talked to the President, I said, some people will say that you had nothing to do with it, that our administration had nothing to do with it. And that's OK, because the fact is that we work for the people. And the reality of it is that it was local communities. It was states like California leading the way with Governor Schwarzenegger and now with Governor Brown that had made those changes, that had made those investments. The passage here of the RPS and the leadership of California really showed the rest of the world that it could be done. So just the word that I wanted to leave with you all here on this uh, Energy and Water Summit that you have convened here is that the United States of America is in the lead and we are the pride of the world in terms of what we're doing with energy all across the board. And for that, we should always be very proud of, and you should give yourselves a round of applause because you in California have been leading the way. So give yourselves a round of applause. And it means a lot. You know, for many times as a U.S. Senator, I would go into places like Iraq and Afghanistan, and you see what happens with uh, the horrors of war. You see what happens when you have a country whose national and international policy is sometimes guided by the sober dependence on foreign oil. But we've, got, we've gotten a long ways to the point where we are now a much more energy secure nation. And much of that is because of what is happening here in the state of California with your utilities who are helping lead the way, with the customers who are buying the energy, with communities who are embracing new forms of energy. And the rest of the country will continue to watch California as it deals with his, these issues in the years ahead. Now, I wanted to spend the time allotted to me uh, this afternoon uh, to talk a little bit about water, because you today in California, as other places around the country, find yourself in the midst of what is one of the most significant water crises probably of your lifetime. Many of you have seen these crises before. Many of you have seen the great droughts of 1990 and other years. But this one is a huge crisis. This drought is creating problems up and down California and throughout the Pacific Northwest. And so in this time of crisis, I sometimes wonder what the opportunity is. There was a person in the White House who was once one of the chiefs of staffs, who President, President Obama, who said, never let a crisis go to waste. In the crisis, find an opportunity. So in this crisis, as you think about the pains that it brings to the people of California, my suggestion to you is let's find hope, because there is so much that is happening that is good 
in the state of California as you seek to find solutions that will help deal with these kinds of issues over the long term. Yes, there is huge pain. If you think of those in agriculture, farmers whose livelihood depends on them being able to plant their seeds and being able to take their crop to harvest and yet not being able to harvest anything and be able to keep paying the mortgage at the bank, there is pain there. Yes, there is pain with respect to homeowners who are paying lots of money now under and having to live under water restrictions for the water supply that is provided to them. And there's pain for industry who has to pay ever growing water rates uh, for their ability to continue their business. And there's pain for those of you, and that's all of us, who care about our planet and who see what's happening with a number of different species who are on the brink of extinction simply because there is no water to carry them on. So there's lots of risk and lots of pain. And so sometimes when you get into a crisis situation, you know, it's easy to start pointing fingers and to blaming others for the problems and to try to create divisions between agriculturalists and environmentalists, Democrats and Republicans. And so your summit here today in Southern California hopefully is transcending those kinds of divisive approaches and looking to finding solutions that will be long lasting to the state of California. And because of the leadership that has been taken by Governor Brown and many of you who are here, I think we are uh, finding solutions to long term challenges that do face the state of California in terms of water. I want to spend a few minutes just telling you a little bit about my own background and how it is that I became a water lawyer, why it is that I became director of the Department of Natural Resources and ultimately went to the U.S. Senate on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and then Secretary of Interior. My family has been around the United States for a long time. Not quite as long as Jeff's, we can't go back 4,000 or 14,000 years, but we were part of the settlement of the Southwest and my family helped found the city of Holy Faith, the city of Santa Fe, New Mexico back in 1598. We've been on the same lands and the same farms now for nearly four centuries. The specific ranch and farm where my mother and my father raised us has been in the family's hands for about 150 years, right on the southern border of Colorado. So we've been around a long time. I became a water lawyer in part because it was a place where there were lots of fights. And I knew that as a water lawyer, I would have employment. So I went to go do an interview with the Attorney General of Colorado at the time, and it was hard as a first year law student finding a job, but uh, the Attorney General said, well, we have this huge water war that's going on in Colorado. The speculator has come in, and we have seven river basins in the state. And they have filed applications in each one of those water basins. We need somebody to help us organize what we do. I said, well, I'd be happy to work on it. Uh, you know, I have a little experience in water. You know, my family has been irrigating from a ditch that has an appropriation date of May 15, 1857. That was before Colorado became a state. It was when the first settlers were moving up from New Mexico into what is now southern Colorado. And I remember the fights among the neighbors. If you were upstream, you generally got your water. If you were downstream on the lower end of the ditch, sometimes you didn't get your water. Uh, someone uh, once quipped to me, a neighbor, that they'd rather be at the upper end of the ditch with the most junior water right than at the lower end of the ditch with the most senior water right. Because by the time the water got to you at the lower end of the ditch, somebody upstream would have stolen your water. <laughs> And so I was used to those kinds of stories as I was growing up. And during my lifetime, I've had the opportunity to work on many of these kinds of issues across our country and even beyond our country. Here in California, I first was introduced to the subject of drought and the issues around the Colorado River. In 1990, when I became executive director of the Department of Natural Resources, it was a time when there was lots of possibility that the states would enter into long-lasting litigation that ultimately would be U.S. Supreme Court litigation that would go on for endless years and countless millions of dollars with no result. We were, at the time, just because of the Colorado River compact allocations, knowing that Colorado had more water 
than we were actually using. And we also knew that California was using a significant amount more water than the 4.4 million acre feet entitled under the Colorado River Compact. And we were also aware that there was a possibility that there would be a lawsuit of humongous proportion involving the seven states. And so as I came in to be executive director of the Department of Natural Resources, I said to the team and to the governor of the state of Colorado at the time, we need to find a different way. We need to figure out whether there is a forum of collaboration that can help us deal with the tough issues that the Colorado River Basin and the seven states will, sh will have to confront together over the decades and many, many years ahead. So as a result of that, I got on a little plane with the state engineer and the director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board, and we flew to Sacramento. We went to Arizona, Salt Lake, Wyoming, New Mexico, Nevada, all the seven states of the Colorado River. And that began the discussions that over many, many years led to the cooperation that today we see going on in the Colorado River. Now, it hasn't been without a lot of pain and without a lot of people figuring out what some of the solutions are. But at least today, you don't see the kind of mammoth litigation that we are now seeing between, for example, in the southeastern part of the United States between Florida and Georgia. Georgia. You see the states coming together to try to collaborate on how we deal with water flows on the Colorado River, how we manage a system which is declining in water supply and a place of the country, which is such an important part of the country that continues to grow in numbers that no one ever forecasted 20 or 30 years ago. And so there's lots of things that have happened that I think would have been unforeseen some 25 years ago, including one particular agreement that was reached in the last several years, which I helped craft. And it was an agreement between the seven states and the nation of Mexico, Minute 319. It essentially came out through a part of this long collaboration, negotiations with Mexico, in a concept that makes a lot of sense for both Mexico and the seven states. Mexico was allowed to store a part of its entitlement in the reservoirs of the United States. And as a result of that, they could deliver water supply, their entitlement into Mexico, to places where their dams had basically been torn apart by an earthquake that had happened earlier. And for us here in the United States, it meant that we were able to keep water in places like Lake Mead and Lake Powell that allowed us to keep the water levels of those particular reservoirs up. And so within the Colorado River context and the seven states, there is much more cooperation and collaboration today than there was in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s. I see some of that happening here in California as well. Shortly after I became Secretary of Interior, someone called me. I think her name is Feinstein. And I got another call from a governor by Schwarzenegger who said, we need your help. We got a big problem in California. We've had this issue in the Bay Delta where we wheel water from the north to the south. And it's been a Gorgian knot and a ball of worms that nobody can figure out. We can't figure out how we're going to move forward. So we need the United States of America to come and help us deal with those issues. And I said, well, we have tried to do this before. I had a great deputy secretary of interior by the name of David Hayes, who when Bruce Babbitt was secretary of the interior had been involved in the early negotiations on the Bay Delta, trying to figure out whether something could be done. But I came out to meet with the governor and I still remember getting on the helicopter with the Terminator, if you will, and flying around the Bay Delta and seeing the different projects, the Central Valley Project and the State Project, watching how water was being wheeled across the Bay Delta, watching some of the wetlands that uh, were important to the Bay Delta area, and also having a conversation about how this pivotal, pivotal infrastructure for the state of California was so much at risk. You live in an area that is blessed. You also live in an area of high risk because of the seismic activity. I think then and still today, the probability is 60% or so that in the next several decades, you're going to see some kind of a seismic event that will breach the levees in the Bay Delta. But what will that then mean to the state of California and its water supply, its transportation and transfer of water, which now 
provides so much water to so many people and to so many farmers and other uses uh, across, across the state. So that was our early entree as Secretary of Interior into the issue. Fast forward, we now have a Democrat by the name of Jerry Brown who gets elected to be your governor. And I had worked with Governor Schwarzenegger on so many issues. I'd probably been out here for 10 to 15 meetings with him on, on, on different matters. But the two areas that we had worked on were the areas that are the subject of this summit. It was renewable energy and it was water. Now, I've been around politics for a long time, so I know a lot of presidents, I know a lot of governors, I know a lot of senators, I know a lot of members of the General Assembly. And I kind of know what happens when the new guy comes in and the old guy leaves. When the new guy comes in, he doesn't want to do much with what the other guy has done because he, want, he or she want to establish their own legacy as governor or president or whatever it may be. Well, I was concerned. So I picked up the phone and I called Governor Brown. And I said, I want to come and meet with you. And I want to talk about energy. And I want to talk about water. So he said, sure, Ken, come on down. So a few weeks later, after his inauguration, I was in Sacramento. I walked into his office and expected to walk, walk into a different kind of office, but there was a picnic table there. And I sat down at the picnic table with the governor and John Laird and others who you probably know in this room, and a couple of our people from the Department of Interior and uh, some other folks who were there with me on that particular trip. And Governor Brown said to me, he said, I know you're worried that uh, I don't want to continue to work on these water issues or renewable energy. He said, I'm going to tell you a story. He says, I'm here now as governor of California because I want to make a difference. And what I've come to learn is I watched this office when I was a little boy, and Edmund Burke was governor of the state of California. And then I came back as a grown man, and I was governor of this state, and I decided I had ambitions to be president. And then I, those went awry, and I came back to be attorney general, and I'm back here. And now I want to get things done that are going to last, and I want to get things built that are going to last. That's a lesson that I have learned. And that means that I want to work with the United States of America to make sure that we continue this renewable energy revolution and that we address the water issues of our state. And so between the governor and uh, Schwarzenegger and Governor Brown and I, the co-equal goals of restoration of the Bay Delta along with uh, reliability essentially were born out of those conversations with many of the players who are here in this room. Now, that issue obviously is one of the issues which is part of the action plan for water for California. But there are so many other issues which are so important. It was probably 2012 or maybe the early part of 2013 when uh, Congressman Raul Ruiz called and he said, Ken, we have a disaster looming in the Salton Sea. I had seen the Salton Sea before and I knew its history and how the sea itself had been created because of the breach back in the early 1900s. But he said, we have an environmental disaster, but it's, is it in its creation? Because as the water in the Salton Sea declines, you're going to create major environmental problems for all of Southern California. So I'd like you to come out and meet with me. And I'd like Senator Boxer to come out and meet with me at the Salton Sea. So I did that. And we came out and we watched some of the some of the realities of the Salton Sea and some of the challenges and some of the limitations. So I gave you that background only to tell you that these California water issues have been near and dear to my heart for a very, very long time. So today, as I share these comments with you, I think that the greatest challenge here is, again, you have major growth in an overstressed system. If you look at the demand for water here in California today, you can say it outstrips, obviously, its native supplies, including its exported supplies. But I want each of you to think about what happens as you all project into the future when you reach the population of 50 million as a state. 50 million people, you know, 38 million. As I understand it now, Greg, is what we have here in the state of California. 
What happens when we bring in 12 million more people into this great and wonderful state? It's unimaginable when you think about those numbers if you come from a small state like the state of Colorado where in our entire history, the population of my state today is 5.3 million. If you think of that huge state of Wyoming with about 600,000 people, the population of California is, what, 40 times, 50 times bigger than the entire state of Wyoming. So the question for you is, you shoehorn 12 million more people into the state of California. Huge impacts, yes, on infrastructure and transportation and other issues, but huge impacts on water supply as well. And so the dialogue that you're having today on how you move forward on the water issue is a very important one. Secondly, there are demands today in 2015 that those who built the state project or the Central Valley project never had in mind at the time that those were being built. It was a Californian president, Richard Nixon, who signed the Endangered Species Act into law, who signed the National Environmental Policy Act into law, and who brought in the entire panoply of the environmental regulatory framework with which we all in America, no matter where you are from, live with today. And those regulations now require us to be more careful with our planet and with our wildlife and with our fish than we had to be back 50 or 60 years ago. And so there are growing demands and will be growing demands to make sure that we're taking care of some of those ecological values. I sometimes think about that growing demand for water across the United States. Some of it is, yes, just for recreation, for in-stream flows like the rafting on the Arkansas River in Colorado, but some of it is for in-stream flows for the ecological values that it brings with it. Well, when I was growing up as a young man irrigating off the Rio San Antonio in the San Luis Valley, my father taught me that because we had a very senior water right on that river, that we could command the stream to 100% of its flow. We did not have to let a single water go beneath our dam, not a single drop of water go beneath our dam. That's the prior appropriation system, which we grew up with, which has resulted in much of the situation that we find ourselves with our rivers today. And yet, as the, value, the environmental regulatory framework of the United States and the state of California and public demand has grown, we're seeing new things happen with respect to in-stream flows. I had the honor of coming here several years ago and visiting the San Joaquin River, where for the first time water was flowing and the people of that community had this great sense that someday they would see salmon in that river again. And I saw the water flowing in that river for the first time in probably 50 years. So I expect that no matter the demagoguery and political uh, fighting that sometimes takes place over those issues, that we will continue to see those environmental demands be very much a part of the future of how we deal with water supply. Now, as we look at those increasing demands, we also have to recognize the reality that we're looking at shrinking water supply. So more demand, yet less water. Yes, less water. If you think about just one aspect of the water supply for California, a very significant part of it comes from the Colorado River. There's been some hundred and three or four different models that have been run on the future of the water supply of the Colorado River. And they've all concluded that because of the climate changing in our earth, in our world, that we're gonna be seeing a decline that could be as much as 25 to 30 percent in the water supply from the Colorado River. What does that then mean to the states that are dependent on the Colorado River? What does it mean to California and this part of California that is so dependent on water from the Colorado River? What does it mean when in the northern Sierras, the water that now flows across the Bay Delta that comes into the projects that come south 
where they continue to decline in water supply, shrinking water supply. So those are just facts. Some people will debate them, but most scientists would tell you that's some of the reality that we live with here in California. So hence the question for you, the question for the governor, members of the General Assembly, the California Resources Board, MWD, San Diego Water Authority, Indian tribes who are very essential to all this, is how are we going to manage our time forward with limited water supplies? It can be enough to make a grown woman or a grown man cry, saying, it's too complicated. It's not going to happen. We just can't do it. But here's the reality. I think it can be done. I think there is hope. And I think that's why this conference is so important for all of you to have these kinds of conversations. You know, it is sometimes a crisis that creates impotence for great change. And I think that's what you have been seeing here in California over the last five years. No one would ever want to say to the state of California that we're glad you're in a drought and we're glad the suffering is going on. Nobody is glad about that. Nobody wants that to happen. But you all know in your own personal lives or in your own institutional representations here that sometimes big change happens when people feel the pain and when there is crisis. And that's where California is this year in this driest year of modern times, in this biggest drought probably in the last 500 years. This is where California finds itself today. And so what are the hopes that I see and the cornerstones and the foundation that you have around your world to address these issues? So first and foremost, I remember it was California just in the last couple of years that passed a bond issue to provide $7 billion of money to invest in a whole array of initiatives to deal with water. From efficiency to integrated water supply management to dealing with the groundwater reality of some basins in California. To the people of California to say, we recognize how important this issue is, that we're willing to authorize a bond issue of $7 billion says a lot about the people of California. And it's one of those things that gives me a lot of hope. But not only there, you have two governors now, one a Republican, now one a Democrat, Schwarzenegger and Brown, who have been working very hard to try to figure this out with a long-term view. Not just putting a Band-Aid on it and thinking that, you know, next year is gonna be a better water year and uh, we're gonna have El Nino we're going to have a lot of water supply, and so we just buy another year or another two years. Thank you, Greg. They're looking, as they have been with all of you in this room, looking at the long term. And so as you look at that long term, besides the bond issue, I think you ought to applaud the water action plan that the governor and many of you worked on for so long. When you look at that, that water action plan for the state of California, I think it has all the elements that can help us create the sustainability that we want. Conservation, we know how important conservation is. Integrated water supply management. So we have the entities that provide the water creating an overall integrated water supply management program the Bay Delta solution on the co-eco goals, the protection and restoration of the most valuable ecosystems of the state of California, drought preparedness and management so California doesn't get caught in drought cycles without a plan on how it's going to address those things. Water storage, yes, above ground, there is room for doing things above ground, mostly in the off-channel area, some in Northern California and other places, but some of that is there. Below the ground, underground. You think about what all of these areas, including some of the alluvial areas of California, the potential that they have for groundwater storage. Clean water for communities. You, know, you think about places around the world and Africa, Latin America, and 
in the undeveloped countries where people have to drink a water supply that is contaminated. There are still people in the United States who are in that situation. There are people here in California who are in that situation. So safe water supplies. Flood protection. You know the ravages of fire. You know the ravages of floods because you've lived through them. I've seen the tragedies of both, but being ready for those. Creating regulatory efficiency so good ideas don't just get caught up in a knot that doesn't take them anywhere. And then sustainable financing. Those 10 points to me are another part of this foundation of hope. So you have financing through the bond issue. You have an action plan and updates on that action plan that I know you have received. You have, in addition to that, something that people said could not have happened three years ago. And that's the state of California deciding that it's time to regulate groundwater. Can you imagine, I think it's probably 30 or 40 percent of the water supply used in California comes from the ground. And yet, there was no regulatory system for how we managed our groundwater. And for those of you who are engineers or have worked in water, you know the reality that they are connected, that the water flows in our rivers are co connected to our aquifers unless you happen to be mining groundwater from someplace. And yet we had no regulation over groundwater in California. So yes, there was subsistence or subsidence. And yes, there were other kinds of problems that came from the lack of regulation of groundwater. And yet somehow the crisis, the crisis led to the state of California saying, yes, we will start regulating groundwater. Now it's not easy. Let me just tell you a little anecdotal story about my own San Luis Valley. In the state of Colorado in 1965, we passed the Colorado Groundwater Management Act. That act recognized the integration of surface and groundwater supplies. And yet, now some 50 years later, one of the biggest fights is going on in the valley because you have surface water rights owners who have been irrigating from water rights that are 150 years old, whose water ends probably July 1 to July 15th in my state, in my valley. And then you have the groundwater pumpers who continue to pump through the hot months of August and into September. So you can understand why a surface water rights owner with an 1860s or 1870s water right looks at the neighbor that's pumping away nearly willy and they have concerns. And so, yes, even though we have a Groundwater Management Act that was passed in 1965, it's taken about 50 years for the state engineer to put together a set of regulations that now will start managing the aquifer in a way that creates sustainability over a couple of decades. So it won't be easy, but the fact that the state of California has a groundwater act in place, I think is one of those parts of the foundation of hope. You see action going on in Washington, dysfunctional as Washington is, and I've been a part of many of witnessing many of those, those dysfunctions with respect to water. The division between Republicans and Democrats, which at the end of the day to me makes no sense for the people of California who are looking for solutions. You have a House of Representatives with a Republican water bill that basically says do, a, do away with the environmental protections and pushing that issue as far as they can. But then you have others, including Republicans and Democrats, who are saying, no, we need to come up with some common sense solutions. So we have legislation now pending in the United States Senate by Senator Feinstein where she talks about water recycling and desalinization and she talks about storage and a funding stream to help make some of those things happen. And so you here at this water summit could help fuel another part of the foundation of hope and that's to get Washington working again. You ought not to stand for Republicans and Democrats pointing fingers at each other and saying that they can't get anything done. If there's anything that I think the American people are fed up with, it's a Washington, D.C. that's supposed to represent the most powerful, wonderful nation in the country, and they can't seem to get it done. I would hope that with respect to California water and this crisis, that they can, in fact, 
get it done.